This week on Machinery PTV, folks, an episode you're not gonna wanna miss, a special from the John Deere Pavilion. We're diving into the history of how tractors were made in the U.S. back in the late 1800s up through the 1920s. We're gonna visit with Neil Dahlstrom, who has a book out called Tractor Wars. Your machinery is a serious investment and at the heart of every farming operation. Some call it a passion. We're Machinery Peak TV, and today we'll cover everything from auction roundups to the classics to the latest trends and technology. Machinery Peak, the most trusted name in farm equipment. Machinery Peak thanks these premier sponsors for their support. Sullivan Auctioneers, let our team of professionals show you how to make your auction a success. Visit SullivanAuctioneers.com. A&I Products is a lower cost, quality replacement part solution for all types and ages of ag equipment across all brands. Visit AIProducts.com. For farmers working to lift, change, and repair tires on their home farms, check out the Tire Grabber at TheTireGrabber.com. Hey folks, welcome to a very special episode of Machinery PTV, coming to you this week from the John Deere Pavilion in Moline, Illinois, and I tell you, we have got a fascinating show, folks. I've wanted to do this for years, a whole show devoted to the John Deere history and their archives, and a special guest, we're going to visit with Neil Dahlstrom, the historian archivist with Deere, and he has a new book out called Tractor Wars that came out January of 22. It's already in its second printing. And I tell you what, folks, this book is full of amazing anecdotes on the history of tractor development from the late 1800s up through the 1920s. Now, Neil, I call you the archivist historian for Deer. Your official title is? Is Branded Properties and Heritage Manager. Okay, so you, now how long have you been working with the archive here and at John Deere History? I've been with Deer for almost 21 years. I've spent, I think, 16 of those in the archives in some capacity. Okay, so are you headquartered here in Moline? I'm in East Moline, uh, which is right down the street. That's where the archives are. Okay. And we're at the pavilion here, by the way, beautiful facility. And did you mention it's the 25th year? It is, it's the 25th anniversary. We opened in 1997. Okay. And I understand some big events coming here in, uh, in 2022? Yeah, there is. Um, in August, we're also celebrating the 150th anniversary of the city of Moline. Wow. So from August 22nd through the 29th, we have a week long um, of, of events planned, including concerts and a lot of fun activities, some new exhibits at the pavilion. So lots to see. Now, Neil, I so enjoyed when you joined me on our Machine Repeat podcast. I think I, I could have talked to you for hours and hours, but you're just full of, of information about John Deere. And on the topic of Moline, is it is it accurate that John Deere was a former mayor of Moline, Illinois? He was. He was the second mayor of Moline. The second. And it, it's funny, when I learned we were celebrating the 150th anniversary, I said, are we sure? And uh, because John Deere moved here in 1848, um, but what we're celebrating is the current form of government, the mayor, the city council, the incorporation of the city in 1872. Neil, your roots are right here in the Quad Cities. You grew up, was it East Moline? I grew up in East Moline. Okay. And uh, so what high school was that then? East Moline High School? United Township High School. Okay. Yeah, so my graduating class was almost 500. It was a, a fairly large school. Okay. And the irony is that I grew up playing soccer. It was an open field, which now I know was the John Deere Foundry, the Un Union Malleable Iron Company in the early 20th century. It was the soccer fields when I was a kid. Yep. And my office is now directly across the street. And I, I, I can't remember noticing the building and the giant John Deere sign in front of it my entire childhood. And when I was hired to join the John Deere archives, I lived in Virginia. You were out east. And I was out east, and I had no idea John Deere had an archive. Hey, stay tuned, folks. Coming up, more of my conversation with Neil Dahlstrom, the archivist with John Deere. Fascinating stories on how tractors were developed over 100 years ago. I need to ask this for all our audience. So what is in the John Deere archives? I mean, I know it's a lot, Yeah, but give, give us a sense. Yeah, it's, it's the million dollar question. And I, th I think it's different than, than what people think. Oftentimes people think, well, we just, 
we collect one of everything. And as much as I'd like to, 185 years later, it's really hard to say we're going to have one of everything. And the reality is the archives didn't start until 1976. We had a head start because we had an agricultural library at John Deere starting in the very early 20th century. Okay. So they kept things like speeches and board of directors minutes, um, journals and scrapbooks from certain people. So we had a strong foundation. But 1976, I'm guessing that maybe was tied to the bicentennial? It was, yeah, 100%. And recognition 1987 was the 150th anniversary of the company. But really the driver was John Deere hired Wayne Braille, who was a professor at Dartmouth, to write a corporate history. Um, the book's called John Deere's Company. It's about eight or 900 pages. Wow. Um, it's the book that sits on my desk. And when people ask me questions, that's usually my first go-to. That's the John Deere Bible? It's the John Deere Bible. Um, unfortunately, it ends in 1984. He spent eight years on it. Wow. And it's fully, for someone like me, it's fully indexed and cited. So we can go back and pull the original records and, and, and documents. So that's really important to me. Because I've seen, you know, the 4440 you guys own with like 20 hours on it, and the 7810 with like six hours and the 4960. But what was the impetus to keep them? That wasn't a company decision necessarily, was it? It's, it's not uh, uh, like a top-down decision. It, it really comes from factories. It comes from people. It comes from engineers who say, yeah, this is, this is going to be really important. So it's everything from historical pieces. We have walking plows, um, the uh, uh, deer sulky from 1905, which is green and yellow, one of the earliest green and yellow pieces we have, to an 8RX, you know, to a 4010 cutaway, to a 730 cutaway, to uh, a John Deere Lance 300, which was the first co-branded um, John Deere tractor built in Mannheim, Germany. So, so part, one of the ways we look at it is we want to represent the brand. We want to represent all the divisions. Um, we're looking for milestone machines, the first of, the 1 millionth gator, the 500,000th gator, those sorts of things. Right. Um, also recognizing that John Deere sells equipment, so we don't always get first pick. But the reality is um, we've got limited places we can exhibit equipment. And the last thing that I want to do is buy something and put it in storage so it's never seen again. Right. We'd much rather see um, private owners driving these things cross country, telling stories. They're the brand ambassador. Exactly, a, a hundred percent. So, so we try to be mindful of that. And we have a lot to learn from everyone who's out there running it or grew up with the machine versus Neil sitting in his office looking at old records because that only tells you part of the story. And now as I look around the pavilion here, I, I think we maybe have some interesting stories. This, what is this, a 55 behind us here? Right. Now this one, you were telling me the company actually did purchase? We, we did purchase it in, in, in the early 1980s. Okay. And um, this combine was actually a Farm Progress show last fall. Mm. Uh, so we, we drove it directly from Farm Progress show and parked it into the pavilion. You didn't have it out in the field demos? No, we didn't have it in the field demos. It's the hard part of managing a historical equipment collection is we don't like to run it. We don't like to be outside. So that was a big step for us. That would have been the hit of the show, but you know that. Either. Yeah, yeah. When you have an item like this, it could be a farmer owned or whatever, I've just sensed with social media, all I really have to do is show this picture and then people bring their own experiences. Maybe my grandpa had one, my great grandpa, and the discussion just goes whoosh. Yeah, it, it, it's my favorite part. I, I think some of it comes from, I, I, was, I was pretty introverted growing up, so I did a lot of listening. Sure. And I'm always intrigued by the motivations of people of what's driving them, what happens. And a lot of decisions are made because someone's not in the room anymore or someone's got a side business or they've got a personal interest and, and you've got to factor that in the equation. I think we often think about, especially machines, and it's easy in hindsight to say, well, you should have come out with this or why did you pass on this acquisition? The reality is there's a lot of other factors, there's a lot of other context and you've got to really dig into that to understand the full story and to understand what you got right and what you got wrong. Well, folks, Modern John Deere tractors, it's easy to look at them and think deer has always been dominant, but you know what? We came within a whisker of that not being the case. Stay tuned, we're gonna get the real story from Neil Dahlstrom. Got equipment to sell privately, but tired of scams and hassles? Visit machinerepeat.com and click sell mine. 
MachineryPete.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. Let's go back to the John Deere Pavilion in Moline, Illinois with Neil Dahlstrom. Well, Neil, I so enjoyed when you joined me on our Machine Repeat podcast to talk about the release of the book, which just came out January of 22. And I understand now you're already going into a second printing? We are. It's exciting. It's very exciting. And I, folks, if you haven't bought this book, you got to go onto Amazon and order it. It's only like 25 bucks right, right. now. It, it, you sent me a copy of it, and it, I was just mesmerize the stories. Now, your history as an archivist, historian, going back, this this book is looking about late 1800s up to about 1920s? Right, yeah, and, and most of it occurs between 1908 and 1928, okay. but yeah, it really starts kind of with the steam era and, and kind of sets us up for the advent of the, the gasoline and the kerosene tractor of the early 20th century. So now our, our farm audience, you know, very passionate folks with, they love their tractor, whatever color, and that they're all connected to the history. But it's easy, I think, to look around at, you know, there's a, a you know, a 8RX370 sitting over there, and you think, well, John Deere, John Deere's always been John Deere. But this history, that was very fluid, and how many companies were making tractors back, you know, over 100 years ago? Yeah, they, there were over 160 in the 1920s. Wow. And, and it, it's an industry that went from less than 10 in 1910 or so, and by 1920, there were 166. So how that all played out with who had the market share, I mean, uh, at one point, I think uh, International early on had, in your book, I, I forget the was it 40% of the early market share? Yeah, and even, even more than that, at one point, they were, you know, starting with, well, I mean, they started very early, but then with the, the Titan and the Mogul line, really had a large market share. And... Um, and then a lot of people were kind of trying to figure out what the market was, because that's one of the challenges. You have to have capital and resources. What does the customer want? And your customer is a horse farmer. So how do you convince them to take a leap and say, well, replace your team of horses with a tractor? Let's talk Henry Ford. Uh, you had an anecdote in your book when he was a young boy. He grew up on a farm outside of Dearborn, outside right, of Detroit. Right. And there was a particular day was it a steam engine he heard? Yeah, he was 12, and uh, he and his dad were, were, were out and saw a broken down steam engine. And he just grilled the man who, who had it and was just fascinated by it. Um, and, and Henry Ford was a tinkerer. He used to repair watches for people as a kid and just loved working on things, was very mechanical. And he saw this, and, and he, it just kind of implanted in his head this idea of, of mobile power. And uh, I've, I've, yeah, I, I kind of think about it in terms of, well, the automobile kind of got in his way for a while because he, he wanted to build a farm tractor. Yeah, that was interesting in the book. You, you dive deep on that. Uh, so really you think Henry Ford's true desire was modernize American farms with tractors. Yeah, it, it, it was. And he, um, he used the word drudgery all the time. And he said he didn't understand why, why farmers would do the same work over and over again. And, and I look at, I mean, farmers are like everybody else. You have early adopters who are on the front, front edge of everything. You have the folks who are kind of waiting to see, and, and that may have nothing to do with the technology. It may have to do with your operation, the cycle of things, what's going on. Finances, whatever. Exactly, and then you have the folks who are kind of waiting to see how it plays out. And there's so much of that in the book because manufacturers looked at it the same way. Sure. And, and do I have capital to build a factory or design a new machine? Is it a two-cylinder machine, a four-cylinder machine? Like, what's the market? We don't know. Um, who are the customers who are going to adopt this and field test it for us and go out and advocate on behalf of it? But Henry Ford wanted to build a farm tractor. He started experimenting very early. The uh, Model T came out in October of 1908. And a month later, he sent a, a photo to the Farm Implement News, a farm publication, and said, I'm working on a tractor. A month after the Model T came out? Right. And, and, and I think what probably would have happened was people read it and said, well, here's somebody else that we've never heard of who says they're gonna build a farm tractor and everyone else who says it never makes good on it. And six months later, everybody knew who Henry Ford was. They changed so, the world with the automobile. Yeah. Exactly, so he had credibility now that nobody else had. But he never left the idea of we're gonna, we're gonna do tractors. No, he, he didn't. And it's, it's one of the things that really fascinated me, and he believed in it so much when he went to the board of directors at the Ford Motor Company 
Um, they said no. So he formed a, a separate company with his son Edsel uh, to build farm tractors because the board of directors said there's no income in farm tractors. There's no profitability. You're not spending our, our, our profit on farm tractors. Got equipment to sell? Sell it on the Machine Repeat monthly online auction. Call 844-727-6374 and we'll connect you with one of our auction partners to get your equipment listed. We think about the, the, the archives in terms of collections, photographs, documents, correspondence, um, those sorts of records. But I, I love anything connected to John Deere, the person, partially because he's the founder, but also because there isn't a whole lot. There's, there's only, I think, seven or eight photographs of John Deere that are known to exist. There's three or four letters. Okay. And, and, and one of my that's favorite. That's it? Three or four letters? That's, yeah. wow. Yeah. So a lot of what we know comes from others. It, it comes from the, um, well, one, maybe one of my favorite pieces and one of the most important pieces in our collection are the journals of Robert Tate. John Deere moved to Moline in 1848 with Robert Tate and John Gould. Robert Tate kept a journal for 40 years. 40 years. So we have the journals in our collection. He tells us that in July, they raised the rafters on the plow shop for the first time and put it in operation. He's a day by day accounting. We know when he planted strawberries. We know when he went to church with the deers. Wow. Um, we know when they dissolved in 1852 because John Deere complained about finances all the time and Tate couldn't take it anymore. Mm, interesting. <laughs> so you learn a lot about personalities yeah. that way. So those contemporary resources are really important. Oh, to hear that invoice, I mean, that's fascinating. Now, uh, and so looking forward, I mean, you're, as an archivist, history for deer, you're, you're dealing with the history, but as it applies to going forward, I mean, John Deere is, is pushing the envelope. I mean, autonomous tractors right. and helping farmers be better. Uh, how do you view your job, the unique position you're in with deer pushing forward but maybe things we can learn from the past, bringing forward to the company and to you know, uh, farmers who use John Deere equipment. Yeah, there's, there's, there's always something there. And I, I think about, we, we, we say things like past is prologue, or if you don't know your past, you don't know your future. And, and, and that's great and it's true, but you have to break it down. And, and one of the things that we did is, is looked at these very transformational eras in company history, because we're in one now. You just look at growth of the business, the, the acquisition of, of, of Virkin a few years ago, um, just kind of the expansion of the company and, and, and the strategy moving forward. Well, you can find eras in company history where that happened. Uh, you can point to 1910 to 1918, John Deere acquired and consolidated a dozen other companies. Uh, companies like Dane and the Syracuse Chilled Plow Company, uh, Van Brunt, which is Horicon, uh, so you start kind of looking at that. We entered the harvesting business in 1912, uh, and it kind of culminated with the acquisition of the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company in 1918. It's a transformational period. The employee force tripled. Sales went from $3 million a year to over $30 million a year. So to look back and say, yeah, a lot of things happen in between, but there's these transformational periods and it's important to recognize it's not a year. We often think, well, it was one product, it was one invention, it was one year. These things take longer, but it seems like with every transformational era, the um, timeline gets shorter and shorter. So, so this time it's shorter and you gotta continue to innovate. That's why we use that word. Well, folks, thanks for joining us this week on Machinery PTV, our visit to the John Deere Pavilion. What a fun visit we had with Neil uh, Dahls from the Archivist Historian with John Deere here. And again, the best $25 you'll ever spend, folks. Go out to Amazon and order his book, Tractor Wars. And if you want more information on the history of John Deere, go to visitjohndeere.com. Machinery Pete thanks these premier sponsors for their support. Sullivan Auctioneers, let our team of professionals show you how to make your auction a success. Visit sullivanauctioneers.com. A&I Products is a lower cost, quality replacement part solution for all types and ages of ag equipment across all brands. Visit AIProducts.com. 
For farmers working to lift, change, and repair tires on their home farms, check out the Tire Grabber at thetiregrabber.com.